Well, let's go ahead and start with a quick word of prayer. God, may the, the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing unto you. Holy Spirit, you, we pray that you'd be with us now as we open your word, that you might open our hearts and our minds to uh, your word and your truth. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. So grace is free, but not cheap. Matthew 21 and forward. So the background. As many of you know, in my private life, my day job, I am a federal trade prosecutor. What a lot of you might not know is that that's more than just going to the court all the time. We uh, do things that we call immediate accesses, which are kind of like an FBI raid. Uh, except because I'm not a criminal prosecutor, I'm a civil prosecutor, I don't have a search warrant, I have a court order. And although I bring policemen with me with, with guns, we're not allowed to break down the door. We have to knock. And once you knock, we come in whether you ask us or not. So it's not an FBI raid, but it might feel like it if you're the person who is on the receiving end. And the policemen that, uh, that we come with us, whether they're federal marshals or local sheriffs, first thing they do is always say, do you have any weapons? Great, I'm going to remove your ammunition from your weapons. I'm sure you'll agree with that. Yeah. And they do. Well, the last place I raided was a place uh, here in North Texas, and they made their business out of ripping off churches and church schools. What they did, it was a, a standard type of fraud where they would sell you on one thing and then send you something else. Now what they would sell you on was that they were a local business that were going out of business, that their local warehouse was gonna ship everything back to Texas, and they came up with a great idea instead of paying for the cost of shipping, they were gonna give it to local churches and church schools at a discount because they're such good people. All right, now of course, there never is any, there's never been a, a, a local warehouse. There's only been the one warehouse here in North Texas. So, they play this word game with you where you think you're buying 12 pins and you're buying 12 boxes of pins. And you think you're paying a certain amount per pin, but you're paying a certain amount per item. So you get 12 times much more than you wanted, but your bill's a lot more than 12 times what you thought you were gonna get. And it's never a discounted price. It's always way over the retail price. And the worst part about it is, is they do this to churches and church schools, and then they tell the pastors and the principals that they have a tape of you, and that that's exactly what you ordered and you don't want a scandal destroying your church or your church school. And some of the things they've said to some of this, these pastors, I can't repeat in a church. It's so horrible. So they've done $7 million of business in the last five years. They're on the top of our list. They were the top. There's an entire industry that has a special law applies to them because it's such an industry that's rife with fraud. They were on the top of our complaint list, so we're going to shut them down. And what happens when I show up? Well, we go in, we remove their ammunition from their weapon, and we have a Geek Squad squad with us, and we start photocopying the hot documents. The Geek Squad starts copying all the computers, and I start walking around from room to room to find what I'm looking for, which is scripts, which is proof that they know they're lying, and I found it. But the other thing that I found was walls full of crosses just like that wall in posters with praying hands and the most fervent Christian prayers on them. Every other room had some type of massive Christian art or poster or artwork. And I was just dismayed. And at the end of the day, we had had a lot of them there most of the day. We let, let most of the employees go. But at the end of the day, the office manager, who I had identified was the worst going in, the office manager who admitted to me that she had four different names because you never know what people will do to you. You've got to use fictitious names. The office manager tried to convince me that she had done something wrong and that it was all those pastors and principals that were liars, not her. And did she, did she really think, Eric, do you really think that I've done something wrong? And I had to look at her and say, ma'am, I think you need to spend a whole day in confessional, and I'm Protestant, 
<laughs> and she got so lofty and puffed up, and she raised her hand and she said, Mr. Robertson, I'm a member of the, and I won't tell you the name of the church, but I'm a member of the so-and-so, so-and-so church, and I've been saved by the blood of Jesus. Just like that. And I know when I die, I'm going to heaven. And my heart sank. And I didn't know what to say. And all I said, well, is, well, you need to look in the mirror then. You need to look in the mirror. Because you're doing something really wrong. So, I started thinking about what the problem was that I had come across. And it's a problem of free grace versus cheap grace. Now, first of all, you have to go back to what is free grace. As Methodists, we believe Jesus died for everybody's sin. As Methodists, we believe the man on the cross didn't do anything to earn his salvation. Just said, Jesus, I want to be with you in your kingdom. And he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. We talked about that just the other week. We believe that anyone can turn from their ways and turn to God and they'll be saved. Now this was shocking when Wesley preached it. Uh, and he published this sermon. It was uh, preached as sermon number 128. It was preached in Bristol, England in 1740. And it was almost scandalous because as we talked about when we talked about the history and life of Wesley, at his time, there were two main groups. The English Catholic Church, you thought you had to work your way into heaven. Heaven and the Puritans in the Church of England and a lot of them that were out of the Church of England that thought you had to live this pure life, but you would never know if you were saved or not because you had to be chosen and you never know if you were chosen. And so this idea that not only that grace was for everyone and that grace was for you and that you could know it, it was scandalous. It was so shocking. But that's why Methodism spread, this idea that grace is free. Now the problem is, is that in our society, people think that if something's free, it's cheap. You know, if you don't pay something for it, as a matter of fact, one of the things that some charities do just so that people won't abuse them is they charge just a small amount. If you charge someone just $10 for something that should cost several hundred, people will take it seriously. But if it's totally free, sometimes people will take it for granted and not actually use it and will abuse your time. When it comes to grace, there's a problem, and the problem's been around for a while. And the, first of all, it's a problem right now. Right now, there are televangelists and there are churches that are teaching the gospel, uh, the gospel of prosperity, and they're teaching that God's purpose exists. He only exists just to bless you. And that you can just sit there on a couch like a blessing sponge, and he'll just pour blessings down from heaven, and you don't do anything for it. And, and they're right in one respect. We never earn God's blessings, but the idea of the Christian life is to not sit there and do nothing. Now, this was a problem in, in 1937. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship, or that's the, the name that it sold under, under its current uh, most widely used English translation. And if you don't know who Bonhoeffer is, you should, first of all, because it, he's a wonderful guy. I had known his name, but I had never read him uh, until recently. And uh, he was in America when war broke out in Germany. He was uh, going around the country uh, uh, giving lectures and he decided to go back to his native Germany because he decided that he couldn't help Germany after the war if he didn't live through the horrors of the war. Hitler killed him three weeks before Germany fell. He had been in prison for two years for trying to help Jews out, and then they find, found out that he was part of the conspiracy um, uh, that was recently made to a movie called uh, uh, Valkyrie. So, he wrote the, uh, the book, The Cost of Discipleship. The first chapter is all about cheap grace. And in it he says, cheap grace is the grace that costs you nothing. It's justification of the sin without justification of the sinner. It's preaching forgiveness without preaching repentance. It's the whole idea that because we have to do nothing in order to earn God's salvation, after God saves us, eh, we ought to do nothing then either. And it's produced a church that looks just like the world. Now, it wasn't just today. It wasn't just in 1937. Paul had the same problem with the church in Galatia. There were two groups in the church of Galatia when he wrote the book of Galatians. And the whole book is basically about these two different items. 
One group is a group that is a bunch of Jewish Christians that want to take the word and they want to say all the laws of the Hebrew laws, the Hebrew Old Testament, all of those laws you have to follow before you can become a Christian. So you have to be circumcised. So you have to keep kosher. You have to do all these things. And they had another group that said just the opposite. No, we are so free in Christ that we can do anything. We are so free in Christ that, hey, guess what? When we sin, we get more grace. So the more we sin, the more grace we have. That's kind of like getting closer to God. Now, isn't that a good? I would think only a lawyer could come up with something like that. <laughs> but nevertheless, this group of people, um, and, you know, one group wanted to apply the law. The other group wanted to apply libertinism, wanted to apply this idea that everything is free, everything is good. Paul said no. Both are wrong. So I want to talk not about what Paul said to the Galatians, but some broader analogies that are in different places throughout the Bible that I think really set this down and really talk about what the Christian life is supposed to be. And how even today, when I give you some of these examples, you're going to think, yeah, yeah, that means we can rest on our sofa and do nothing. One of them is the tree. And David in Psalm 1 talks about trees. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount talks about trees. Another one is the apple leaf. Paul to the church in Corinth talks about the apple leaf. So, the tree in Psalm 1, and here's a picture of a tree planted by waters, and you've all, you've, I'm sure you have it in, in your mind, I'm sure you have it memorized, but I'm gonna go ahead and read it. So let's take a look at Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of the sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. All right. Near tree, planted by the river. You don't have to move. You don't have to walk. You don't have to do nothing. You just sit there and you do nothing. You just soak up God's love. There are some people who read that that way. First of all, how does a person plant themselves by the river? <laughs> by doing something, by reading and meditating on God's word, by being constantly accessing it. But more than that, this tree right here, it looks like it's doing nothing. Guess what? Trees never stop working. The roots are always pulling up water to the trunk and sending it to the branches. The leaves are always out looking for sun. The leaves will move to the sun. I love watching time-lapse pictures of trees on a sunny day. You see the leaves moving to the sun as the sun goes around. Trees don't move? Well, yeah, they do move. And what else does a tree do? It yields its fruit in its season. It yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf doesn't wither, and it yields its fruit in its season. We want to take a look at that in Psalm 1 and say, Oh, we do nothing. God just bathes us with water. God bathes us with water so that we can do what we're made for. And that's what the tree is in Matthew 7, 15 through 20, towards the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Thank you. Um, and what that says here is, and it's interesting because Jesus uses the tree not in the midst of a discipleship moment, but in the midst of a teaching moment about how you can know someone is truly God's person. Jesus says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by your fruit, they will rec you shall recognize them. All right. So, again, it's easy to take a look at this, this, this idea of the tree. But a good tree 
produces good fruit. If you want to know, if you want to ask yourself, am I at where I'm supposed to be right now? In my spiritual walk, in my spiritual journey? All you got to do is ask yourself, what kind of fruit do you have? What kind of fruit do you have? What does your life show? Now the problem is, there's all kinds of fruit. You know, the person who's an apple tree thinks there's only apples. But the good news is that Jesus understands that we're all different people. He's not asking the apple tree to make oranges. He's not asking the orange tree to make apples. As a matter of fact, one of the most, I think, misunderstood verses in the Bible is in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, where Jesus talks about the yoke. And the reason it's so misunderstood is because Jesus himself puts it. He says, come to you, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Right? It sounds like, oh, it's overtime, right? Except what's a yoke for? A yoke is for work. As a matter of fact, in the midst of that easy and light is the word burden. A yoke goes on a beast of burden to connect that beast, usually to another beast, if, it's, if the beast is alone, then the yoke really has to be well made because it's, it's uneven. But if a beast is hooked up to another beast and the yoke is made personally to that beast by a master or yoke maker, then it hits the shoulders just perfectly. It hits the shoulders light and easy. So when the work is done, because the yoke matches you, you don't get bruised and you don't get bloody. Jesus isn't saying, I'm going to give you a life that's free of work, a life that's free of, of moving forward to a spiritual goal. He says, I'm going to make certain that the goals I have for you match who you are. I'm going to make certain that the work I have for you matches who you are. It will match who you are so much that you will consider the burden light. It's still a burden. It's still work. You still have things to do. And I think one of the reasons the church is not growing the way it should right now is because the church never asks anybody to do anything, much less pray more. And apparently I need to water my lawn. <laughs> so there you go. All right, so the yoke is easy and the burden is light, but the yoke is work. Again, one of the most misunderstood verses around, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Nobody ever memorizes 2, 8, 9, and 10. Verses 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Everyone stops there. The next verse, For we are God's workmanship, and Jesus has, and Jesus has prepared works in advance for us. Right? We're not saved to wallow in grace like a pig wallows in mud. We're saved to go out and share God's love with other people. And we're all made to have fruit. We're made to do the work that's prepared for us. Now, the athlete in Corinthians. I love Corinthians. First of all, Corinth was a town a lot like modern America. And that it thought it was modern. It was a trade center. It thought it had so many things. And it was a town that was sports crazy. And I'm sports crazy. I will admit it. I will admit it. I have a hard time when the Rangers play in Seattle because I have to go to bed before the game's over or I'm going to be miserable the next day. So here we have the athlete. And, and Paul, talking to a bunch of Greek people, has this reference to the athlete. And he says, um, and we're going to read that, um, 9.24 through 27. Do you know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. All right. The thing about, and, it, and a lot of you, I'm sure, played sports and still do, whether it's hacking around the golf course or otherwise. And the fact of the matter is, is that when you are in a sport that's right for you, 
they can't keep you off the field. You're disappointed when the other team shows up. And my daughter, who's in dance right now, I knew that she wasn't meant to be a volleyball player despite the fact that she's almost six feet tall. Because every time I said, let's go out and pass the ball, she'd be like, no, not now, Dad. And I'd turn around a couple of minutes later, she'd be dancing. She's made to be a dancer. And she's a successful dancer. She just made captain of the high school drill team. Why? Because she dances all the time. You can't keep her from dancing because that's what she was made to be. That's who she is. That's what she does. And for her, I don't have to tell her to get sleep. She knows she needs it. I don't have to tell her to eat healthy. That is part of her dancing. I don't have to tell her to lay aside and stay away from these people over here. They'll get you in trouble. And she knows it because her goal is focused on a prize. And that's the way we ought to live the Christian life. And the prize is Christ. The prize is God. And it's not that we're so worried about every little sin and every little jot and tittle and all 624 laws in the Old Testament. It's that we're so worried about loving God right. And, and we're so focused on doing what we're set out to do. And for each, it's something slightly different, but it's all the same. It's all what God is laying in front of us. So the question is, do you have any goals in your Christian walk? Have you sat down and looked in the mirror? Have you sat down? I run. I ran a half marathon last year. Before I did it, I prepared for it. I had time. I had goals. I had a stopwatch. The problem is it's harder in the Christian life. We don't have stopwatches. Now, it would be interesting if I sent around a piece of paper and said, how many minutes do you pray every day? And one of the reasons we're going to talk about prayer is because I think that's one of the areas that the church most needs to really focus on. But the question is, do you have any goals for your Christian walk? That's what we're going to try and do in this series. So, next we're going to talk about the motivations for the Christian life. After that, uh, we're going to talk about the spiritual disciplines. We're kind of going to have a broad survey. And then after that, we're going to dive real deep into prayer and in the Bible study. And so, there you have it. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. Thank you.